Hello and welcome back to Versus Live. I'm Todd Anderson. That's Ross Maram. We got Rob over in the booth taking all your questions as we play out this second match of the day featuring the London Mulligan. We're continuing our delve through Modern to see if London Mulligan actually affects these combo decks the way we think it does, as well as these fair decks the way we think it does. Ross, tell me what you think so far. So far... It's been pretty helpful to the linear decks that we've played with. We just saw Amulet beat Burn, largely on the back of the London Mulligan rule, benefiting the Titans over the Goblin Guides. Uh, this is going to be a matchup where I'm not sure how much it plays into it, but I'm interested to see if it does. Mm. Because we've heard a lot about whether or not they, or how the London Mulligan rule will affect linear decks or unfair decks. And we've got two very fair decks playing in this matchup. We've got Azorius Control on Todd's side, Golgari Midrange on my side, and you know, normally you think of these matchups as long attrition based, so the extra card matters. You don't need to get ahead uh, by a lot. But, you know, in Magic in 2019, you often use an early positioning advantage to maneuver yourself in a way to gain card advantage to set up for the late game. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't go for the jugular right away, but you apply enough pressure on your opponent to force them to use their cards awkwardly, maybe blow a removal spell on a creature they wouldn't want to, or blow a removal spell and tap out so that you can resolve a bigger threat uh, in the face of you know, Cryptic Command or something like that, uh, or even just you know, forcing you to maybe use Supreme Verdict as just a one-for-one -one removal spell instead of getting a two-for-one. Anything like that can... The, uh, can get you a small advantage, and those things can cascade. You, know, you could have to be forced to verdict for as a one for one tap out. I play a, a tireless tracker, get another land off of it. Now you're forced to use a removal spell there, and you end the game like losing to my creature lands when you have counter spells in your hand, something yeah. like that. So you know, coming out quickly is still important because those early positioning advantage ca advantages can cascade in into material advantages, and the London Mulligan rule could certainly help. Um, you know, both decks set up better in the early game and then recoup that card later. Yeah, uh, so fair decks, or what I like to call them uh, dynamic strategies. We have linear strategies and dynamic strategies. Uh, I wrote a lot about those in my article that came out yesterday on Star City Games. So uh, while we are on break or after today's first live, make sure to go check that out on StarCityGames.com premium side. Um, yeah, so two dynamic strategies that are going to be facing off against each other. One aggressive slant, one control slant, and we're going to see how the London Mulligan affects you specifically, I think, because if you have an, uh, a, a, a Mulligan into a hand that has like a bunch to removal you know you can just throw that on the bottom of the deck and start playing like a normal game of magic whereas before if you had a look at a six or a five card hand that had one or two removal cells in it those cards are effectively dead until five or six until i activate a celestial colonnade for example yeah that's a that's another good point in these game ones especially from the non-control side you do have dead cards so the mulligan is less impactful for me on a material side uh, from a material perspective, in game one at least. So the London Mulligan should probably favor this side of things, the Golgari side, uh, at least until the Fatal Pushes come out of my deck. Mm -hmm. I do like that this list is heavy on Assassin's Trophy. It's a card that covers any all of the different threats in the metagame and can cover your Planeswalkers, which are pretty heavy in the Azorius build. Yep. So that's going to help me out as well. You know, and between, you know, th there's this desire not to play too many of those effects to give your opponent extra lands, but when you already have four Field of Ruin like this deck has, and then you have Assassin's Trophy, eventually you just sort of overload on them and they become good because you get all the lands out of your opponent's deck. So overloading on them is often a good plan, and the Azorius deck does that too with Path mm -hmm. and Field of Ruin. Right. All right, well, let's go ahead and get to the games. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure to tag SEG Tour in the Twitch chat. Our buddy Rob's going to be picking his favorite questions, comments, and burns yep. out of those. And uh, I lost the first match of the day, so let's take a look at our opener. Uh, oof. Oofta. I'm actually going to take a mulligan here. This hand's not that bad, right? We have, we have two lands, a mana leak. A spell snare, but you look at the rest of the hand. We have a logic knot, which uh, it's kind of hard to cast unless we draw a blue source. It also just might not be effective because we don't have things to put in the graveyard. Um, if Ross hits our like mana leak with a discard spell, you know there's a chance that our hand doesn't do much of anything. And terminus is effectively a dead card unless I draw a Jace or hit six mana. So I'm gonna throw this back in hopes that my six a little bit better. Plus, I think I'm just gonna lean towards Mulliganing here just to try out the new uh, London Mulligan. Well, I have a five lander with a Kalidus, which is one of my worst threats. So. Uh, we're going to send this one back as well. All right. Anything while we're shuffling, Mr. Robbo? Yeah, we did get our Hesteus question in. Ooh. Uh, if you don't know what your opponent is playing, do you think the London Mulligan is worse for mid-range decks because they're not sure which part of their deck will be good in the matchup? I mean, absolutely, but the, the same can be said about just keeping sevens and sixes in the dark. You know, like if you're 
uh, hand has a fatal, like, I, I don't know how often I keep a hand that has, like, one or two removal spells in my opener, and I think to myself, especially in standard, if my opponent is playing a control deck, this hand's awful. But if they're playing an aggro deck, this hand's insane. And I think it's just going to be exactly the same when you take London Mulligan, except you're just going to choose, like, flip a coin. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to put all removal spells on the bottom, or I'm going to keep all my, my removal spells. And you just got to... Guess yeah. right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think a lot of people are going to get scared and try to hedge. Be like, okay, I've mulliganed, and I see a hand with two removal spells. I don't want to have two dead cards, so I'll put one back uh, and be this middle way. I think you're going to be better off, better suited just saying, you know, I'm going to try to beat a creature deck this game, and if my opponent's playing control, I'm probably going to lose uh, and go from there if they're playing a linear deck. So just steer into the skid at that point and, uh, you know, hope you hit the right person. All right, taking a look at my uh, first mulligan, I actually have a pretty good hand with effectively a dead card in hand that's way better in my deck. We're going to put this Terminus on the bottom of the deck, definitely where I want to be, where I can shuffle it into the top of my deck later with this polluted Delta. So this six-card hand is a lot better than the, uh, the hand we saw just a moment ago. Yeah, another good aspect of the London mulligan is the interaction with Terminus for these decks. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we saw that with uh, with Dredge on Tuesday. Being able to put Creeping Chill and Narcomy back in the deck was a pretty huge deal. So, you know, maybe actually see just a lot more of those Miracle-type cards making their way into the modern format, because if they're in your open hand, you can just put them on the bottom. Yeah. Um, this 7 is excellent, to the point where I don't know which card <laughs> to put back. Nice. Well, you got to put one back. I think I have time to find the more time to find this effect than any of the others, and I like to, you know, front load my hand with these sorts of effects. And I'll have time to find a replacement for this, so I'm going to put that one on the bottom. All right, start with a polluted delta and a pass. Um, I will fetch to 17 for an overgrown tune. want to leave as many basics in my deck as possible, even though I have a lot. Uh, Not or snaps? Uh... Definitely logic knot. Means he probably has his one of dark confidant he's going to be casting next turn. So you, have, you have island plane snap cryptic? Yep. Okay. Pass the turn. Now, I don't want to take damage, and I definitely want a second white as well as just a blue. So I'm going to go ahead and, and fetch tapped here. Um, a miracle at terminus now. Okay. Just sure. right now, this turn. Yeah, great. Not after that. Yeah, after that, you would be very sad. Yeah. All right, so I'm at 19. You're at 17. Yep. All right, untap. Miracle draw. Ooh, probably the best draw on the deck. Search for Wisconsin on turn two. Definitely would have taken that one. <laughs> but I also have my one dark confidant. <laughs> yeah. Pass the turn. All right, search for Wisconsin. We're looking for path to exile. Ooh, terminus off the top. Is this, even, is this real Are you life? mad? Are you mad, bro? Your turn. All right, snap crypt. And of course, the search for Scott left it on top, and I drew it. And then I cast it for Miracle Cost. Sure. Pass the turn. It's gone to trigger. So we got uh, land instant sorcery. Ghost Quarter can let us play the Cryptic Command, but I think I'm just going to graveyard it. Draw. Okay. Your turn. That's pretty nice. Um, yeah, he knows the contents of my hand. So worst come north, he just smacked me for three. six. All right, so 17, uh, that was 16 from the fetch. Oh, yeah, I missed the fetch. So 16 for you, 17 for me. So I got. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just play Tracker. Okay. Uh, play a Quagmire, get a Max McVD. Yep. It's been a while since we had a Maxi over here. Pass the turn. All right, untap, search. Uh, we'll graveyard the land, pushing towards transforming, as well as just looking for a sweeper effect. I will, I guess, say go. So, let's draw. Um, play a Twilight Mire, get a second clue. Mm-hmm. Now, we, we kind of just have to let the, the Tiles Tracker gain card advantage here. My my goal, I think, is going to be to just go EOT bounce draw. And he's already played a land, so if he activates treetop, then I might just go tap draw. Just look for a sweeper. I'm not sure. Declare tax. Um, yeah, sure. I'll take it. 
Take six, minute ten. Unless you want to crack some clues. Nope. You can go to ten. Okay. I will... Hmm. Inquisition you. I've never really found a good place to use this last Inquisition. Hmm. Todd can play a Snapcaster, but it's not going to do anything. It'll target... Uh, logic knot. Logic knot, and yeah, I'm just gonna counter it and draw a card. Sure. That way, I can maybe snap draw next turn. Uh, then I will crack a clue, get a counter here, and pass the turn. All right. So unless the top card is a wrath, I think we're just uh, leaving or putting it in the graveyard. So put in the graveyard. That'll transform Miskanta. Draw for turn. Maybe I was supposed to force the Snapcast to the previous turn. I could have played an untapped land with the tracker and Inquisition to then. Yeah, now now he can now Todd has the ability to snap cryptic. Yep. I thought forcing this the cryptic on the Inquisition would be fine, but didn't think about snap cryptic. So let's uh crack this. We still just have land instant sorcery, right? I believe so. There's no creature. Well, that would have been way better last turn. Um, so, play land, get a clue. Yep. Play not spell one. Mm, I'll snap to tap your creatures and draw a card. Tap your creatures and draw a card. Yeah. Not counter the Nile Spell Bomb. I will... So this is still my first main phase. I'm going to pop this Spell Bomb now because I... Uh, this will maintain Goyf as a 3-4 draw card. And yeah, trophy is gone to. No, I'm going to brutality, killing Snapcaster and pitching Urborg to dress you. So now we have land creature instant sorcery artifact. So we're up to a five six, and pass the turn. All right. So you're successfully able to bait the Snapcaster there with the Nile spell bomb. Then use brutality to answer it. And put Todd under a lot of pressure here. What was the other card in your hand? A land? Yeah, planes. Okay. So a verdict here would be good. Yep. Uh, okay, have very happy to see that one. Yeah. Alright, so if we play planes, we can opt field of ruin path. I think I like that. Um I guess we should opt on his turn. There's like very few things I can hit. Um, if I main phase, whereas I can hit a... Uh, you can hit Terminus if you opt on my turn. Yeah. All right. I'll say go. I think I'll maybe wait till upkeep. And step. We'll see. Crack this clue. Sure. Not upkeep. Uh, tax step. Yeah. Well, the, the extra tireless tracker clue might matter. And I have Field of Ruin if you activate, so I think I'm going to go ahead and Opt on upkeep. Well, waiting like it puts me in a weird spot where if I activate here and you find the terminus, I lose a land. If I activate one of the creature lands, sure. Okay, that's that's one of the big things I like about waiting. Um, hmm. That was an interesting set of draws. Uh, so you have two in hand, and I know one of them's opt. Mm -hmm. And this is a five, and this is a six. So, the fact that one of my creature lands by itself is not enough to present lethal through a path exile makes me think there's no point in exposing it to a terminus. So, I 
there, you win. Just didn't draw any interaction other than that one terminus off the top. Or any creature interaction. That was yeah. frustrating. There was a the turn where you made me discard the um the Protect. Snapcaster Mage. Oh. Um or sorry. Or you played the Nile Spell Bomb. You forced me to play the Snapcaster Mage. I think what I should have done is actually just uh, let it happen, threaten to block with Celestial Colony because your creatures are kind of small. Or at least your uh, your Tarmogoyf is still a 3-4, even if you pop the uh, the thing. And then uh, if you don't attack with creatures, I can just activate Ascanta and I get like a second look at, at things. But uh, I don't know. That was that was tough. Like letting you get full value out of now Swell Bomb is a bit risky though, I think. So but I mean I'm I'm you know I'm I'm buying myself one turn. At the expense of just uh, not having the activation of the Ascanta. Yeah. So, alrighty, uh, we're gonna sideboard here. If you have any questions, uh, just ask, ask Rob. Or Rob, we got anything right uh, now? Yeah, we 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 do have uh, one. Okay. Ursulus Gaming. Uh, my choices for an upcoming GP are Blue White or Tron. What do you think of some of the pros of each of the decks in the meta right now? Uh, all my lonely eyes are next to each other. Um. So, Azorius versus Tron. Tron, I think, is getting better because people are sort of ignoring it. Granted, there's a reasonable number of, of Blood Moons around, but you're a lot better at playing through Blood Moon than some of the other decks. Where uh, Than the Primeval Titan decks, for sure. Um, there's... No, there's been a recent influx of some of the Golgari decks like this and Jund because they, some people like their matchup against Arclight Phoenix. So that helps Tron. It also helps Azorius. I generally think Azorius is good against green-black-ish decks. Um, Answer the question. Tron, I think, is good against Dredge. <laughs> I'm just saying, what are the pros of it? Like, You're good against Dredge with Tron. Azorius is much worse. So if you're more worried about Dredge, I would lean towards Tron. I think in general right now I would lean a little bit towards Tron, unless you're very comfortable playing the Azorius deck. Um, I don't think the Azorius deck is very good against Phoenix, though the lists have skewed a lot towards beating that matchup. You see a lot of things like Settle the Wreckage and Celestial Purge, um, and so that might have changed things. But in my experience, the Azorius matchup has been quite good. Uh, so uh, I, I would generally side with Tron, I think. Right now, I think it's just better against more of the top decks, and I like being you know powerful and proactive, things like that. I would go with Tron. I would just make sure you main deck for Relic of Virginus because it is one of your better cards at slowing down the uh, the Phoenix decks with their busted Phoenix draws. I would also lean towards playing more Dismembers in the main, um, just because it allows you to stop Thing in the Ice from transforming early, and uh, as well as just it, it's just a generically good card for like a mono green deck. Um, I think as long as you're you got around like uh, three or four relics and three or four dismembers, I think you're you're in good shape. All right. Well, as far as sideboards are concerned, this is how I'm going to be sideboarding uh, on the play here. Two negates, time of reinforcements, detention sphere, all coming out. Um, while something like time of reinforcements can buy me a lot of time, uh, there are creatures in Ross's deck that the longer they sit on the battlefield, the worse they become for me. So I want to actually just kill them. And time of reinforcements is is more for matchups where we don't uh, necessarily need to kill those creatures right away, whether it's Dark Confidant or Tireless Tracker. Detention Sphere can uh, come out because it's kind of a liability. It's not uh, it's not a permanent answer to anything because he has a lot of copies of things like Assassin's Trophy or Abrupt Decay that he kind of has to leave in. Uh, and then Negate is, like, counter spells in general are not good against Jund, or sorry, Jund variants, like Black Green or Abzan or whatever. So uh, if I want them to be specifically be able to hit the, uh, the two and three drop creatures. And uh, negate doesn't really do that. It it does hit uh, some discard later in the game, but it doesn't it's stop Liliana. it on one. And it does hit Liliana, which uh, can be problematic. But with a bunch of cryptic commands and teferis, um, you also have like, logic knots and mana leaks, right? So uh, it's not like you're lacking in two mana. Yeah, there. But the, the Lilianas are not nearly as bad against this version of control as they would be in in, in some matchups. So we're going to be boarding in uh, a Cataclysmic Gear Hulk just as an extra wrath effect, uh, as well as settle the wreckage just to uh, kind of clear up some of the things that. Uh, Ross can can throw at me as far as like you know 
uh, spraying the board. And then it's not even it's not that good. Uh, it's just like better, I think, than Baneslayer Angel or Lyra because those allow him to just Lily on the Veil minus um, without me getting any real value. Whereas uh, I can knock off like you know one or two creatures until I have a blocker. Yeah. Purge is another answer to Lily. Uh, explosives, a lot of uh, creatures uh, from Black Green side are usually two drops. Uh, Ross's deck actually has way more uh, three drops than, than a lot of them with, with a lot Tracker. of powers trackers. Uh, so it's not going to be as good here, but I think it's still worthwhile. Granted, if I do play my one Urborg, you can engineer explosives for three. Sure. Uh, on my side, Fatal Push is obviously the worst card uh, in the deck, so these are all coming out, and the one Kalidus is the worst threat. Uh, we're bringing in two big things. You know, if this sideboard looks a little weird, this is Tom Ross's list from uh, Dallas Regionals, so you can take it up with him. Uh, <laughs> well, the extra lane in the sideboard comes in in a lot of matches where you just want to have more expensive spells. Yeah, and so we've got two five drops coming in. The this bounce land specifically is good with Tireless Tracker, A, yeah. double land drop, and B, just making sure you actually can get the five. Yeah, and there are times when it, like I'm going to have Rot Farm, I'm going to be limiting our like, number of... Uh, of like total resources because of Liliana and then Rot Farm is, you know, two lands in one. So it'll help me out in those games too. So we've got two big five drops to play. I think the Eldest Reborn is good enough because it, it can handle Planeswalkers. Yep. Uh, and it's just a good source of card advantage. Fulminator is generally good in these matchups, you know, uh, especially now that they have Search for Escanta, so it can blow up Escanta after it transforms. Uh, just getting some tempo advantage by using it as a stone rain is often good, though you'll usually hold it for one of the high impact targets. Um, but sometimes, like, you know, if I have this on the battlefield, Todd can't really tap and leave up four mana unless it's all basics for Cryptic Command. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can make it tough for him to, you know, just uh, deploy his spells and hold up counter magic like he's normally used to. It sort of, like, taxes his mana by an extra one. So they're generally pretty good in this matchup, though we don't have the Culligan's commands that Jun does to bring them back to compound the uh, land destruction. Yeah. All right. Uh, any questions while we're shuffling up? Yeah, we had another one from Hesteus. Uh They were curious, how would you classify Phoenix decks? Aggro, combo, or tempo? I think um, most most decks in Magic are actually hybrids of, of various uh, uh, nomenclature. And I think Phoenix is somewhere near the like combo aggro side of things. Um, and I think... like. Aggro in a lot of senses can be uh, titled as tempo, even though they're, it, tempo is this word that has no meaning anymore. The, and uh, I, I think that it would be like combo aggro, though, just because of uh, the draws featuring Thing in the Ice and Arclight Phoenix uh, kind of feel like cheating sometimes, and their explosiveness, or very explosive draws do come online faster than most fair decks, but I wouldn't consider it any more of a combo aggro deck than something like Hollow One. Very similar in, in build and uh, how it uh, uh, de just deploys its early game pressure. I don't think of the deck as a combo deck at all. I got, I, it feels like that sometimes because of Faithless Looting, but I... Well, how would you classify Dredge? Mm, would, Dredge is a combo deck, but Dredge uses Faithless Looting very differently than Arclight does. Mm. Completely differently. Mm. You cast turn one faithless hitting with dredge ninety percent of the time it's in your hand. You cast it ten percent of the time it's in your hand and is it Phoenix? No, but you're still using it to discard specific things. You just have way more specific things to discard with dredge, so you're fine casting it on one. Also, because you have a bunch of other dig spells with with is it Phoenix, like you're just less incentivized to cast it on one because you have other things to do. That is true, but I've had games where I did not have another cantrip, but I still didn't cast Faithless Suiting. It's just not a it's not a value card. I know, but here, like there, it's just an it, it's an enable for Arclight Phoenix, but that's just a strong tempo play. I think it is Phoenix is modern as the modern analog of Delver Dex and Legacy. I mean, I mean Delver Dex. They aren't nearly as disruptive. Like their interaction yeah. is not the same type of interaction that but that's how modern works. I understand. I'm just saying, like you can't say that it's the equivalent when, like. You could just build a, a deck in modern that's the equivalent. But it, it modern it's being equivalent by having the same cards is not the same as being equivalent by like doing the same thing. It's applying the same principles, but putting it into the context of a different format. In legacy, like you need to be disrupting your opponent or they're gonna race you because the combo decks kill you on turns one, two, and three. And in modern, the combo decks kill you on turns three, four, and five, so you can legitimately like race them just straight up a large portion of the time. 
and focus your disruption being more towards creature decks. So it's almost like um, the blue red Delver er, is a Delver decks that existed during Treasure Cruise. Like those lists did not play as many Wastelands, did not play as many Spell Pierces. They still have Days Enforceable well because those cards are really good. Yeah, but they were more focused on their proactive game plan because it was so strong. The Is It Phoenix deck has such a strong proactive game plan that it gets to focus on that. At least I mean, relative sure. to the rest of modern. Look, I, all I'm saying is that there are, there are plenty of decks in modern where the card spell pierce is very good, right? Uh, and in in this scenario, like you're you're basically saying that it's the analog equivalent of a deck that, but it functions completely differently. So it doesn't really make sense to me. I I, I know what you're trying to say it fills the same role as the aggro deck that has some disruption. It just disrupts on a different wavelength and its aggressive plan is significantly different. And the way that you tax their aggressive game plan is significantly different. Like, you can't beat a Delver deck with a Surgical Extraction. The same way you can't beat, uh, you know, an Arc... Like, you can't... You can't beat Arclight Phoenix without something like Surgical, but you, you can beat Delver Seekers by just using Fatal Push or whatever. Sure. That's just a tactical difference, but it's still a tempo deck. Like, look at the finals match I played against Jeffrey Carr in Baltimore. Like, he comes out swinging aggressively in games one and three, and on turn two, it looks like, man, I'm dead because the, it looks because my deck doesn't look like it has a lot of defensive measures. And then Thing in the Ice just turns the round the game around so quickly. The same way like Gurmag Angler does it for Delver decks. You often have to have like Angler plus a Daze, but in this case, Thing in the Ice is just a all in one package. Okay. Uh, we're just arguing semantics. It's fine. So uh, I'm not going to mulligan my opener here. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got lands and spells. Keep most hit. spell decks. With, most hands with lands and spells. Yeah. Well, I ha I have lands and spell. So <laughs> that one's going to go back. I started with five lands. Kalidas Thoughtseize last game, and we boarded out the Kalidas. So I guess we replaced it with another land. I don't think the Rot Farm is in that hand though, so it can't be a direct one for one. Any more questions over there, Rob? Uh, not really. We just had another question that we covered before about, do you think Force is safe to print nope. in Modern? Nope. There are a lot of cards in Legacy that I feel give Legacy part of its identity. I think that Wasteland, Brainstorm, and Force of Will are certainly three of those cards. And you could argue that things like Dark Ritual, and there's a couple others that, like, are obviously way yeah. too good for, for modern. Yeah. Obviously way too good for modern, but still uh, have the potential for for play in 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 legacy without being too overpowered. And uh, I think Wasteland, Force, Dark Depths, uh, Dark Ritual. Dark Ritual. And that's about it. There's like maybe a couple others that, I mean, obviously you can say, hey, well, you know, this deck in, in Modern can kill you on turn two or whatever. Like Scorio's Vengeance deck, you know, wh what's the, the point? But the problem is those decks aren't consistent. And in Modern, it's just like a completely, completely different environment. Okay. Uh, so this is a solid seven. Uh, even though this, is, this would be a, a fine card in this hand, but I think it's a card we have to send back because it's so expensive. Uh, so we'll eventually, you know, get there and cast our bigger things later in the game. All right, call Nade Ghoul. How many creature lands are in your deck? I'm curious. Uh, I could, don't remember the exact number, but it's. I saw a Quagmire in. Uh, yeah, in, I think uh, there's. Treetop Village. I think there's two of each, so there's four total. I'm gonna go to 17 again for an overgrown tomb and, and cast this discard. That is correct, two of each. All right, you want to oust or spell snare? Uh, let me check out my hand first. Um. I will take the spell center. Okay. 17. You can go. All right. Here you go. I'm going to go ahead and kind of shortcut this with the caveat that I can change it based on what you do. Yeah. I don't think there's much of a point in playing a two drop into this oust when I could potentially double spell with it later or maybe like make Todd's mana more awkward on a later turn. I don't think I'm making his mana awkward the following turn because there's not really three mana plays in the Azorius deck. You know, if he has Search for Scanta, he'll play it alongside the oust. If he has a counter spell, he can hold it up after casting the oust. So I'm not constricting his mana in any way. I think that's just sort of a mana that's going to go to waste. So I think I'll take this time to get the Quagmire onto the battlefield. Found tapped. Draw. 
Um, your turn. All right, Alice to Plains, Jace. Yep. Twilight Mire, Fulminator. Sure. Pass the turn. Mm, draw turn. Yep. Jeez. Sure. I'm going to tick up because he has the Quagmire and just force him to bust a uh, Assassin's Trophy or something, which kind of invalidates the Fulminator. I'm going to just do myself. I don't know what's in his hand. I don't know what I'm trying to keep him from drawing, but I know, like, if I see a good card on top, I'll definitely keep it. And with how he's going to be taxing my mana with Fulminator Mage, I don't think Opt is a card I want on top, even though it's, a, it's better than a natural random draw. Um, the mana investment here is not something that I'm looking for because of how my hand is set up against that Fulminator, potentially. So we're going to put it on bottom. Your turn. Sorry. Got to use Black Blast for Planeswalkers. That's an interesting one. Um, so we definitely have to pop this one. I'm going to crack a Catacombs. I'm going to just go to 16. I don't want to like throw life points around too much. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um... Do I want a forest or a swamp? Probably just want a swamp. Uh, I'm going to Collective Brutality you with the Duress mode, and that's it. I will take the Cryptic Command. This game is going to go on for a while. I'll just take the most powerful card. You have an answer for Jace? I do. Tilt. I have an Assassin's Trophy. Yeah, I was kind of afraid of that. So at this point, like Todd has a ton of mana. I don't think there's a point in me sacking the Fulminator Mage at all. If he ever goes to activate Colonnade, then I get to kill it then. Or if he goes to kill the Fulminator, I'll deal with the Colonnade. But for now, I can just attack for two. Yep. Easy to 18. That's one of the, the benefits of uh, Colonnade is that you... Uh, 17. Yeah, I'm at 17. 17. You have those um, If you're, or One of the benefits of Fulminator Mage is that it keeps the creature lands in check. And also can just attack. And if I don't ever answer it, it just keeps hitting me for two. All right. So uh, let's just play the island and pass turn. Activate Quagmire. Attack. All right, so I'm going to force him to use the Fulminator, and we're fine doing this while the shields are down, basically. We'll take two, down two, 15. 15. Play another Quagmire, pass the turn. Okay. Draw. Play a Ghost Quarter and say go. See, so now I have Tarn Oust. There's no point in activating a Quagmire. Um, you send me down a land, it's not that big of a deal. It's not a yeah. field ruin. If you can use four mana, it's highly advantageous, or even, I don't know, whatever. Pass the turn. Okay. Uh, draw. Go ahead and play this Golden Tarn he knows about and say go. So you have house to two unknowns. Yep. Interesting. Very interesting. Not a huge fan of the Ghost Quarter in this deck. I think just four fielder ruins probably fine. Ghost Quarter is, I mean, even though it's sitting here looking okay against Quagmire, it's like I would be fine just taking two damage a shot or whatever. Okay, I'm just gonna go for it. Else for one. Oh, man, elite. Cool. And I'm gonna fetch. I'll go ahead and just get a tapped. Whatever. You're at fourteen. You have two in here now. Yep. You know an oust. Yep. So we're pretty even on you know cards here. Pretty even life. Just so we've traded a bunch of resources. Now it is go time to see who draws better off the top. Oh, well, today's any indication from that burn matchup? It ain't me. Treetop <laughs> village. You can go. I think with this many creature lands, you should just start attacking. I don't know why you wouldn't. Um. Yeah, I guess with the third one, it makes sense. So let's send for two. All right, I'll pop it, you know. And there, there is something to be said for me maybe waiting in case I draw a like, tracker because then the ghost quarter 
Sure. Is it, but now I can activate, like, I have enough mana to activate both of these starting yeah. next turn. So I think w w that factor is, matters more. You can go. go. This is this is now way better if you draw to Fairy or Jace, because I have five damage just from lands. Yeah. So that, that activation is right. Before then, I think it's right to wait. Uh, so you're at 13? Yep, yeah, your turn. Okay. All right, I'm going to path the treetop. Take two down to 11. And even though I'm, like, needing to save this maybe for a creature later on, I still have the house that he knows about. Um, and we just need to protect our life total. You have one one card, just the house? Yeah. yeah. You can go. Or, actually, I should play a, a land. Yeah. All right, you're good. You going to crack it? No, because I Trial got a Trial Striker. Yep, 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 yep. All right, so 11 to 16? Yep. Okay. You know this one. That is pretty good. Um, Tarmogoyf. Okay. Liliana. Sure. My land. Plus Liliana. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have played that Flood of Strand earlier. That's stupid. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to go to 13 and get another Overground Tomb, activate Quagmire and attack. It's fine. I'm going to go ahead and purge the Lily. So, I've been sitting on this Tarmogoyf. I'm at 9. For, oh, I don't have another Just fetch Overground shot. Tomb, do I? Oh. Uh, do you have a forest? Do you have another land? Do I just not? I definitely have more lands, yeah. The deck has a million basics, but okay. okay, so I guess I'm at I'm at fifteen. Sure. And you're at nine. nine. I've been sitting on this charm going from literally turn two, but you had the oust the entire time, and now by the time I've cast it, I've maneuvered in a situation where you just don't have the oust anymore. Yep. And I think that that's very smart. So um so Tarmogoyf currently land instant creature sorcery enchantment. Six. Planeswalker. Oh, jeez. Six, seven. Yep, this is not good. Almost almost lethal with Todd at nine. All right, your turn. I guess I, I can't really draw a Nile spell bomb to make it lethal. <laughs> I mean, I, I could have just, like, pitched the the Celestial Purge and just gone for Alps on the Tarmogoyf to give me more time. But if that Liliana ever gets to ultimate, it's pretty bad. And I have way more answers for one than the other. This gets awkward if Todd has specifically Snapcaster Mage and I go in because he can trade for both. But... The Snapcaster's going to sit here and threaten to trade with the Quagmire anyway, so I might as well just get in. I guess I'm not dead. That's good news to target you. Uh, I drill land. All right. Oh, block. Yeah, I think you trade here. here. Go to, Go to three. three. Pass the turn. I'm still dead if I don't draw anything, right? So. Yeah. St even though this land enters tapped, we have plenty of mana, so still hold it for tracker. Oof. Duh. Okay, I'm dead. That's really unfortunate. Okay. I guess if you had kept... Just if you had chump blocked, you would have gotten yourself another turn with Field of Ruin, but... Yeah. So many removal cells in my deck. Just let me draw them. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, that was a game where both of us flooded out pretty badly, but I just drew three creature lands. Just three terminus on the bottom, eight cards in my deck. Seven cards, excuse me. I don't know, man. I uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. This is one of the reasons why I just kind of hate the Mopey control decks in Modern. Like, even if I had, like drawn a cryptic command there or whatever is if i don't find a way to actually win the game you just get so much time to just beat me down with creature lands like like you as the deck that's always presenting the threats you know like it's a lot easier to find a route to victory than than the, than the control strat we drew you know one planeswalker in the top 25 cards or whatever and, and immediately just got hit with a yeah i got hit with a an assassin's trophy in a spot where he needed either a trophy or maelstrom pulse or some specific thing that targets planeswalkers as opposed to uh you know like a, a removal spell or he didn't have enough creatures to attack and kill it and i had the oust and a potential like path or something off the top so even if he deployed two creatures to be able to potentially threaten it on the following turn um you know i was still going to get to untap with it if he didn't have one of those specifics but we uh i think this is fine i think what this this was decisive enough and i think our, our next match is going to be uh, pretty interesting. What what do we got coming up next, Ross? We got hardened scales on Todd's side against Titan Shift on my side. I think we uh we've already got a changing of the guard. Changing of the marbles, which is unfortunate. So I have Welcome currently home. lost. I just want to point out once again, Ross chose all the matchups for today. This was uh, something that I saw coming. No surprise here. Ross just really wanted his marbles back. Didn't want to give us a fair fight. It's okay. 
Sure. <laughs> you you want to you want to switch sides? Uh, for the third match, yeah, sure. I'll mm-hmm. switch sides. I don't know if we can do that, but sure. Oh no, we already made graphics for it, but we we might switch it up. But our third match, we're gonna have Scape Shift versus uh, Hardened Scales. But do we have any uh, questions we can talk about? Because I I, I want to talk about the Morgan rule, the the London Morgan. That's what today is supposed to be about, and it's uh, feels like you know, a lot I, about like I'm only good both games. Felt like I won pretty handily both times. Yeah. So. I mean, smoothing out your draw, definitely a huge deal, um, especially when you are the deck that has, like, a lot of two drops, you know, and specifically your draws that feature discard spell into two drop are going to be a lot better than your, your draws that feature, like, one or the other. And uh, just being able to see a fresh seven card if, you're, if your first seven is bad, putting, like, a, an extra two drop creature that's not good in the matchup on the bottom of the deck is great, or potentially just uh, putting, like, a redundant discard spell or a second assassin trophy or something on the bottom i ended up putting a nissa on the bottom of my deck that game keeping three lands like discard spell tarmogoy fulminator I was like keep the cheap spells yeah and then didn't cast the tarmogoy for like 17 turns so i mean sure this but, is the uh, way gave, this is the way your hand shaped up yeah uh, i mean and and i think that you played it really smart uh the the not casting anything into ouse until you found a, a way for me to discard the house was a, a game changer. Now, I'll say this. Me playing the Flooded Strand was likely a mistake and me just like kind of playing fast and frustrated because I just kept drawing a bunch of lands. And uh, that one uptick from the Liliana of the Veil completely changed the game because I had to pitch one of my two spells in hand after just flooding yeah. out a uh, massive. Liliana was able to be a two-for-one for right. two spells instead of a land and a spell. Right. And, uh, you know, in, in that scenario, that's that was just like a small misstep again costing me the game and potentially the match. But in modern Modern, small mistakes like that can absolutely change uh, your win record, you know, your win-loss record. And yeah. No, I, th- I think a lot of people in that spot would be like, oh, I lost because I flooded or I lost because my opponent right. topped Liliana. Um, and, and I can complain about losing because I flooded while also recognizing yeah. that I had a chance to be in the game if I didn't punt. Yes. So I, I get I get the I get the double dip. That is <laughs> that is very often how a lot of m- the punts that I make go. Like I'll I'll make a mistake and I'll notice and be like, oh man, if I'd played like this, I'm 100 percent to win. Instead, I'm 95 percent to win, and then my opponent hits the five percenter. I'm like, oh, they're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Robert, what we got? How do you think the new Mulligan rule affects Infect? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, so. I was always a little afraid of mulliganing with Infect, um, but you can't really keep a hand without an Infect creature unless you have Noble Hierarch and maybe you, you're playing a, a version that has like Serum Vision or something and you can maybe keep that hand. Um, so I, I honestly, I think it probably makes the deck a lot better because you you know you, you are kind of a critical mass deck, but at the same time you have like half your deck's one type of thing and half the deck's the other type of thing and you really want to have them both together and any opening hand that has one, not the other is pr- probably going to be a mulligan. You know, if you have a hand that's just like three or four infect creatures and lands, like that's not a good hand. And I'm usually throwing that one back now at the same juncture. If I have a hand that's like five pump spells and two lands or like land noble four pump spells or whatever, like that one's getting shipped too. So, yeah. Oh, but I think on the surface, infect is a sort of a critical mass deck. It looks like that, but it doesn't play out like that as much because you've got some, a lot of chip shot in. You often win with one or two pump spells. Really don't need a, a lot more than that. And I do think the opening turns for infect are super important. Yes. You know, what, what, do you have the ability to hold back and protect your creature? Or do you have to tap out and hope they don't have it? Maybe with the London Mulligan, you're able to play more conservatively in a lot of spots or just force them to have it more. And then your opponent comes up short. Uh, in more games. The, those opening turns when you have turn one Noble Hierarch into like turn two land Blighted Agent, those are so scary that your opponent has to then hold back and maybe you don't have it because you're down a card but you get more time right. because your opening made your hand seem more threatening than it was. You know, Infect is a tough deck to play against and when you, if you're able to set up in the early turns, you're really able to manipulate your opponent a lot and get them to do things that they wouldn't have otherwise done. So the London Mulligan helps that aspect of the Infect deck, that trickiness, you know, that Tom Ross is so well known for, then the it could really help that deck for sure. Here's a question. Do you think it maybe influences how you maybe potentially build the Infect deck from here on out? Maybe shying away from things like mutagenic growth 
uh, and, and more towards the, the plus four, plus four. So you don't need a higher density of those, uh, you know, cheaper pump spells, you know, like with blossoming defense, right. At being added to the deck over the last few years, you start, start to put yourself in a spot where you have a bunch of effects that give plus two, plus two, instead of a bunch of effects that give plus four, plus four, which ultimately needs you, uh, have, has you needing to draw more of those effects. Yeah, I get to see that. I don't think that effect is going to be particularly strong. You're not going to be pushed to like cut way down on growth and play all of like four ground spells or whatever. But if you want to make a you know a slight shift there, so you can more aggressively take those London Mulligans, uh, uh, that makes sense to me. You know, I mean, you, personally, uh, without Jataxi improving the deck, I actually don't like become immense at all. I think that it's a little too slow, and you can get the job done a lot of times by just having a two plus four plus fours, right? And um, in those scenarios, like two mutagenic growth kind of equates to one plus four plus four. But when you start pairing a lot of these with become immense, the math, you either killing by a lot or you're missing by a lot. And, I, and I'm not really in love with with the builds that uh, kind of go hard on mutagenic. So it's possible that if if the if you're able to to take mulligans more aggressively. Um, you can actually just start cutting the the plus two plus twos and start leaning heavily on the plus four plus fours and hope that they're good enough uh, on their own. And uh, when you're down resources, like you're not going to be short because you're you don't get stuck with like a mutagenic growth which is dead like half the time or whatever. Yeah, I can see that. There is right now a necessity of mutagenic growth as a countermeasure to gut shot, um, <sighs> but that's like saying you need to play misstep to counter misstep. And I never really found that to be the case. Yeah, it actually wasn't the case in a lot of decks. I think yeah. people misremember what I think. I think on. you just have to take your licks. Like if you're getting gut shot, you're you just got to get sure. hit with it. I mean it. Just yeah. main deck your twisted images and snipe those things in the ice, and that, you're all gravy after that. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't that people were putting mental misstep in their decks to counter mental misstep. It wasn't going into every deck. It's that the decks that didn't get to play mental misstep effectively weren't good. Yeah. His mental misstep was messed up. Yeah. So this every deck played mental misstep because mental misstep was so good. So what you're saying is you agree that Gutshot is mental misstep in my because <laughs> it's, I, a, it's I did, fundamentally oppressive and costs zero man. I did loudly claim <laughs> slightly off camera after winning in Baltimore that it was the best card of all time. So dude, <laughs> and after my own heart. All right. Well, we're gonna take a short break here on Versus Live while we prepare the third and final match of the day where we're gonna have the hardened skills affinity deck. Uh, battling against uh, Green Red Scape Shift. Now, this matchup is one that uh, should be pretty much a race from both sides, but there's a little bit of interaction from the Scape Shift side. We're going to see just how good that deck is, and if it's fast enough to race this Hardened Scales deck, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back for more Versus Live. 